Hello everyone. Welcome to Jane Austen on Point, historical analysis of dancing in Jane Austen adaptations. I'm Cassie E. Mobley, and today is part two of our two-part series on Jane Austen's gothic satire, Northanger Abbey. If you're new to this series, please check out my intro video called Five Things that Jane Austen adaptations always get wrong about the dancing because it serves as an intro to all the concepts I cover in this series. You can also check out part one of Northanger Abbey where I cover the 1987 adaptation of the novel. As always, here's my standard reminder, I'm not here to ruin your favorite Austen adaptations by pointing out the historical inaccuracies in the dancing. But if hearing that sort of critique will bother you, this is probably not a good series for you. Today we'll be covering the adaptation of Northanger Abbey from 2007. I'll start by giving my opinion of the adaptation as a whole, share one piece of general snark, and then review the dances. I honestly think this is a pretty good adaptation, and it's one I enjoy watching unironically. I love J.J. Field as Mr. Tilney, I love Felicity Jones as Catherine, and I especially love Carrie Mulligan as Isabella. She kind of steals the show in every scene she's in. Her Isabella seems very charming and likable on the surface, but reveals herself underneath as scheming and manipulative in a way that's totally believable. I also love the scenes of Catherine reading actual passages from Udolpho and the Monk, and showing just how scandalous the latter was. I mean, that thing is not safe for work. In general, it's just a solid adaptation, though it doesn't have a high budget, so it's not going to wow you with the visuals or the score. I like the costumes a lot, although the hairstyles are kind of hit and miss. If I'm going to snark about anything, it would be Catherine's cringy sex dream. Why? It's gratuitous, and it feels very voyeuristic in a really uncomfortable sort of way, and it does nothing to further the plot or the characters. I'm not against sex scenes that are done tastefully and are relevant to the plot, but I can't stand pointless, awkward stuff like this. All right now, let's talk about the dances. In the first dance scene, when Catherine and Mrs. Allen walk into the ballroom, the band is playing My Lord Byron's Maggot. But don't let the title fool you, because the tune does not refer to the famous Regency-era poet George Gordon Lord Byron, but rather it refers to one of his ancestors. The tune is actually from 1701, so it's way too early for the Regency. I don't know if they threw it in just because someone saw the title and didn't realize it was the wrong Byron and the tune was from the wrong era, but it just doesn't work here. As to the choreography, we don't really get to see much of the figures apart from a single slipping circle and an allemande, but at least they look fairly good. We hear this tune again in the second ballroom scene when Catherine is talking to Eleanor Tilney, and the choreography looks fairly similar with the addition of long lines forward and back. Actually, when I stopped to think about it, I realized that in all the dozens and dozens of dance manuals I've read from Jane Austen's lifetime, I have never once seen a figure where they tell people to take hands in long lines and go forward and back. But I haven't noticed its absence until this point because it's so ubiquitous in modern English country dancing that I just kind of assumed it was there. That's the danger of assumptions, kids. In the same way, I have to say that although I've been allowing slipping circles for Regency dancing, I don't actually know that the slipping step was used for circling. The only Regency dance manual I've read that actually describes the footwork used for each figure is one by Thomas Wilson, and he says to use three chassés jeté assemblé for a circle. But I do know that the slipping step was used for other figures in his book, notably for Down the Middle and Up Again. So I can't say that the slipping step wasn't period, just that I cannot say emphatically that it was used for circling. However, I'm not going to try to prove a negative and say that it was never used for circling. So overall, the figures for this dance aren't too terrible, but the music is such a glaring anachronism that it kind of ruins the whole effect. 
The next dance is one Catherine does with Mr. Tilney after their official introduction at the ball. My experienced English dancers should recognize this tune immediately because it's a standard of the modern repertoire, Child Grove. But this tune is from 1701, so again, it's a century too old. I also need to point out that this dance is really badly synced with the music, and this is a problem that occurs throughout the movie. Now let's look at the figures. I know I've mentioned this in previous videos, but once again, I have to say that the siding figure is too old for the Regency. And the same goes for the upper double and back and the turn single. Despite this, they have some figures that look good, and I particularly appreciate them using the Allemande figure because it's very iconic of late 18th and early 19th century country dancing. Overall though, this is not the strongest dance. The third dance we see is the dance Catherine does with John Thorpe. The tune is Upon a Summer's Day, which is so old that it's actually from the first ever published book of English country dances, The English Dancing Master, published by John Playford in 1651. So it's ridiculously too early. The same goes for the figures. The turn singles, the up a double and back, and the siding are all glaring anachronisms from at least a hundred years before the Regency and there's no footwork, so that's a failure. Now, before I actually look at the next dance, I have to complain that the MC announces this next dance tune as Upon a Summer's Day. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, next dance will be on a summer's day. When it was actually one they played in the previous ballroom scene. This mistake makes my brain want to explode. They have to know that this tune isn't Upon a Summer's Day because they just used it in the last dance scene. So what gives? Well, my only guess is that the tune is announced in a voiceover, so it makes me think that someone inserted it into the wrong dance scene and nobody picked it up as a continuity error. This makes me sad because on the one hand, I love that they showed a master of ceremonies announcing the next tune, but you have to use the correct name for the correct tune, people. Anyway, I just had to gripe about that because it's just so glaringly wrong. On to the dance itself. If you think the actual tune they're playing sounds familiar, that's because it was used in the 1995 Pride and Prejudice. It's called The Touchstone, and it's from 1775, which means it's plausible for the Regency. But that's really the only kind thing I can say about how it's staged in this version. Comparing the dance as done in this version with how it's staged in the 1995 Pride and Prejudice is a study on how to make the wrong artistic choices for your dancing. The 1995 Pride and Prejudice has a lively tempo, uses decent footwork, and has period accurate figures, which make it look fairly historically accurate. It's not perfect, but it's one of the better examples of dancing from any Jane Austen adaptation. This version, on the other hand, cuts out the footwork, slows down the tempo, and adds anachronistic figures, so it looks much worse. It's the same bare bones of a dance as the other one, but the styling makes an otherwise acceptable dance look glaringly bad in comparison for this version. Also, I have a pet peeve for adaptations where people don't join hands on the stars. I mean, there were some Regency dancing masters that suggested a very light hand grip or just a fingertip hold, but the hands were still supposed to connect with your corner. This just looks bad. And then we get more siding. No, just stop it with the siding already. In all, again, really the only nice thing I can say about this dance is that the tune is plausible and some of the figures are plausible. Everything else just looks bad. Well, that covers all the dances in this adaptation, so what can I give it for an overall score? Three out of four of the tunes are anachronistic, there's almost no footwork, and they use several anachronistic figures in each dance. You can't really see a progression in most of the dances, but two of them do appear to be triple minors, so I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. I will also give them credit for the dances being well rehearsed and executed, which is something, as I said, I will never again take for granted. Honestly, though, the dances in this version are not as strong as they were in the 1987 version. The figures looked a bit better in that one, and the music was much better. So this version only gets 2.5 dance slippers. So now, on to our series recap. Let's take a look at our current leaderboards. In first place is 
Pride and Prejudice 1995 with 3.5 dance slippers. Then it's Pride and Prejudice 2005, Emma 1996 by Miramax, Emma 1996 by ITV, and Northanger Abbey 1987, all with three dance slippers. Followed by Emma 1972, Emma 2009, and Northanger Abbey 2007 with 2.5 dance slippers. Then Emma 2020 with two dance slippers. And finally, way at the bottom, Pride and Prejudice 1980 with just one dance slipper. So that's my review of dances in the 2007 adaptation of Northanger Abbey. If you enjoyed it, please like us, subscribe, and share with your friends. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. In our next installment, we'll be covering Jane Austen's most controversial novel, Mansfield Park. Thanks for watching, and have an ostentatiously good day.